Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess we'll just go through and introduce ourselves while you can see our faces before we share a, a slide deck and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I'm Navid Charori. I teach in the mathematics and computer science department as well as the computer science and engineering departments at Santa Clara University. Uh, my research lab is the EPIC lab that you can see, I guess, on one side right here up on top. Uh, it stands for the Ethical, Pragmatic, and Intelligent Computing Laboratory. Uh, so we work on lots of projects that are humanitarian and relate to education using artificial intelligence and other tools. Julia. Hi, my name is Julia Voss. I'm a faculty member in the English department um, and I teach and study about writing, multimedia composing, and especially about um, designing pedagogies to be both effective, ethical, fair, and equitable, which is how I got connected with this project. All right, my name is uh, Andres Mauricio Calle. I am a master's student. I originally started on this project as a undergraduate student. My major is in computer science and engineering, and my general area of expertise and where I have been working in this project is in artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm Mika. I am a recent Santa Clara grad 2020. I double majored in computer science and mathematics. And yeah, I, I did a lot of the data science work for this project. Hi, my name is Roman Faga. Um, I'm a web design and engineering. And for this project, which I'm recently new to, I'm currently working on the user interface. Max. Uh, my name is Max. Um, I recently joined uh, the group after finishing my uh, applied machine learning course and I'm uh, working on data or moving data in the background for everything. Awesome. Okay, so let me share the screen here. Okay. Hopefully that's working for everybody. Yes, good. Awesome. So um, we've basically introduce ourselves. All right, so uh, let me give you a very brief introduction as to what exactly we're going to be talking about. Uh, so we hear a lot of things in today's educational environment about, oh, studies have shown, and then usually it follows with something that, oh, if you use more of one or other pedagogical tools in your classroom, or whether if you use a certain type of technology in your classroom, you're going to improve the learning for your students. And then sometimes these claims become even more pronounced as to, oh, this will actually increase the learning for the uh, students of color or for women or for some other demographic that, that might be um, you know, uh, underrepresented at the moment. Uh, lots of these claims are not just made you know, out of the blue. However, they are made often based on studies that are done in a vacuum. There are studies that are very, they're controlled. Um, so the, one of the goals that we basically have for this project is to be able to really go through and validate or discredit these kind of claims in order to really give a tool to the education community that can validate, uh, but also generate and create new um, ways of breaking down the pedagogy or use of technology in their classrooms in order to enhance the education for their students. So um, uh, essentially, we're going to talk about uh, a system that is under development by us that is going to uh, eventually be able to make this, uh, this, this transition from the raw data to these analyses that we're looking for. Uh, however, there are many parts of this that are built and results that we have that we're going to be able to show here today to you. Um, so the, the process basically includes us trying to understand and uh, uh, basically categorize the different types of activities that are happening in a class, not the ones that are reported in the syllabus, not that say, oh, we're going to try to have this much discussion. We want to know how much exactly discussion did happen in this particular course so that we can actually use that data in the analysis. Uh, we also want to know what exact technology was used in the class. Yes, the, the, the classroom might have been updated last summer with the state-of-the-art um, technology, but 
people go in and they use none of it. They just write on the board. That's about all they do. Um, okay, so then you can't really judge whether that classroom has been effective in teaching or not uh, if you know people are using the technology in the room. Um, and then, of course, there is the seating issue. So there's lots of research out today talking about, oh, you know, we should have students being in small groups, or they should be sitting in this kind of chair, or they should have the ability to move around, or not. You need them to be like military style, sitting straight in the lines, looking forward. Otherwise, they'll, you know, start floating around and, and not paying attention. Okay, again, these are all claims that uh, we can try to help um, sort of uh, give weight to one side or another. Okay. The, the project that we have built has, has many phases. Uh, it started with getting an institutional review board approval. Um, after that, we were able to install some cameras uh, and, and network them so that then we could get uh, images from classrooms in order to be able to classify what was happening in each one of those classrooms. Uh, then, you know, we had to collected the images. After collecting the images, we had to categorize them. This is a process that has to first happen manually because we have to be able to label the data and then we could bring in a neural network. Today, you guys are going to get an experience of uh, trying to label a few images. Later on, you're going to see that it is an actually difficult and ambiguous task, which is why a neural network is really beneficial. And then we're going to show you how the neural network does that. Uh, then we had to get anonymized data from the registrar's office, or actually we had to get it from the institutional research, but through, I guess, the registrar. Um, then we had to correlate the two in the data science aspect. And this is, uh, and of course, the next phase, which is building the user interface. These two phases, six and seven, are really where we're at. These are the ones where we have some results that we're going to show you today, but we are, are definitely going to have a lot more work that is going to need to happen uh, in six and seven, as we will uh, allude to uh, throughout the presentation. Um, uh, and then we, we will be able to use this particular tool uh, in order to do internal assessments of the classrooms that we are assessing to see how effective they have been in teaching. This was sort of a requirement that the IRB or actually the institutional research gave us. They said, we'll give you the data, but you have to promise to give us something in return, which would be an assessment. Um, so we agreed to that. And, and I think it's a beneficial thing that we can actually do for the university. Um, and then lastly, we would want to make this tool available to anybody, any institution, so that then they could uh, take that tool, uh, collect their own images, and feed them in with the information from their own registrar departments and in order to be able to do both assessments and also development of the uh, course in order to make sure that more people in the demographic that are going to be represented in the class will take be able to take advantage of the offering and actually you know get better grades okay so if we break it down into different categories that we're going to talk about today we have this data gathering and coding uh, my colleague julia is going to talk about this in, in detail uh, in, in a minute um, then we're going to talk about the uh, neural network the neural network is uh, what we call CCID, Classroom Configuration Identifier. Uh, this was developed by a team of students. Andres is here to talk about that. Uh, we actually wrote a paper on this that was published last year in IEEE. Uh, we can talk about that more probably in question and answer or, or uh, later. Um, then there is a data science aspect of this, uh, which uh, Mika is here to talk about and Max, they will, they will uh, uh, tag team different slides here um, and then uh, well actually and then uh, uh, as part of the data science there's also going to be the user interface building which Roland is going to jump in and, and show you an example of what this tool is eventually going to look like um, okay so without um, any taking any more time I'm going to pass it on to Julia you're on mute Thanks. All right. So my project, my part of the project, as Naveed mentioned, uh, focuses on sort of running the human qualitative data coding that will feed into the neural network that we're working on building. If you'd go to the next slide, Naveed. So this just gives you a quick snapshot of the kinds of data that we're working with. So when we talk about uh, analyzing data, developing models, understanding what's happening in classrooms, we're using aerial photography in classrooms. We have about 60,000 of these images, which is another reason why the neural network is important because the idea of coding by hand or like, you know, typing, categorizing by hand that many pictures is just 
mind-blowing. Um, so these photos were collected between 2014 and 2016 from 14 classrooms. You'll see here that a lot of our classrooms are what are called active learning classrooms, ones with mobile furniture, additional screens, multiple projectors. And going back to something that Naveed mentioned, a lot of the existing research about um, act, the benefits of active pedagogies, that is ones that are interactive, that use discussion, that use students coming up and doing presentations, that break up the sort of typical lecture format, have been done in like special lab classrooms, like the university will build a new classroom and then they'll have a special faculty development seminar that everybody who teaches in the, in the classroom takes and then they study the outcome and they're like, this works great. Um, what the classrooms at Santa Clara let us do is that the, the university just built these classrooms and then just stuck faculty in them with no training. There was no cohort for faculty development or anything like that. And so what we're seeing here, what we think that we're able to see here is kind of like what happens with these classrooms like in the wild, where there isn't any real oversight or any special training that faculty get aside from whatever they might seek out themselves. And which kind of gives us a little bit more realistic maybe picture of what difference active learning classrooms as new building features actually do. Um, separated from the sort of aggressive faculty development that's usually attached to them because they cost so much money. Um, so that's where we're, that's what we're focusing on here. So the human coding process that I was overseeing, um, I worked with a team of undergraduate research assistants, 15 of them, um, to kind of make this large task more manageable. For the past 10 weeks, starting in the spring and continuing into the summer, we've been working on norming. That is, so what we're trying to do is to build a set of labeled photos that we'll use to um, track the accuracy of the neural network that other project members are going to talk about in a few minutes. And so to do that, we need to get all on the same page and make sure that we are labeling and interpreting photos in a similar way for this comparison set. So the first thing that we've worked on, or one of the things that we've worked on, the, the undergrad, the RAs and I, is developing categories. So what features of the photographs do we want to highlight as important and meaningful? So if you go to the next point, thanks. Um, so that started out with very simple and basic, relating back to the previous sort of pilot phase of the project that Andres will be talking about in the next section of our um, talk. So we went just from simple layouts, like what visually is happening in the classroom to um, lay, like layouts, and, or what does the classroom look like? Like, is it round? Is it, is it facing forward, et cetera? Um, to layouts and activities. So what's the layout? And then what are students being asked to do in this classroom? Are they listening to a lecture? Are they talking to each other? And then we also introduced um, follow-up questions to specify a little bit even more further what those activities are. And lastly, the idea of ambiguity. How clear is it, one, what's happening, or two, to what extent is the class, are the students pictured in the photos unified in what they're doing versus um, different students doing different things? I think you should be able to skip this next slide actually and go back to the next paragraph one. Go back, yep. Thanks. Um, and then the, so the second piece, and this happens at weekly meetings where I meet with the, the RAs every week to talk about the new set of photos that they've looked at, to collaboratively um, discuss the labeling of photos, especially ambiguous ones. I um, and we use this to refine the definitions. And so if, if discussion, for example, and I'll talk about that in a second, is one of the categories that we care about, then what does discussion look like? How do we recognize it when we see it? Um, do we need maybe to uh, introduce refined categories like subcategories? Um, and this has been helpful in a couple of the cases that, that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so what we're trying to achieve here is a relatively high rate of consistency. And so what you're looking at here, this line graph, is the how consistently the all, all 15 students are being in how they label each photo. And so this is for layouts. You can see that after a bit of a rocky start, things have been going pretty well. And this reflects the fact that the classroom layout is typically not super ambiguous. Like the majority of the class, especially if we're thinking only about occupied chairs, is facing forward, attending to lecture. They're in groups, they're, or it's in a round configuration that is like a circle or a U shape. Where it gets more ambiguous, but arguably more meaningful for teachers is what the next slide shows, which is activities. And here we have things like discussion, group work, head turn for a quick conference with a neighbor, listening to lecture, moving around the classroom, reading and writing as solo activities. And you'll see that for some of these, the um, refinements in the definitions that we're making, like the green line, which represents group work, that Naveed is uh, highlighting with his cursor right now, like refining the definition has, has resulted in a pretty dramatic improvement of accuracy or of um, consistency of, of the sorting there. Um, for other categories, it's a lot more up and down. And in some cases, like this blue line that sort of is in the middle and then is pointing down as you get to week 10. Uh, in, some, in those cases, the definition refinements that we're making seem like they're not making things more clear, so we're going to need to backtrack. And the purpose here is to get to a pretty high rate of consistency. An ideal target would be north of 0.8% um, in order to have photos whose labeling we're really confident in against which to compare the labeling done by the neural network. So that's our target. 
Um, these two slides are a little bit more detailed, so we can skip them in the interest of time. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to give you kind of a sense of what the, uh, the research assistants that I'm working with are doing, we're going to invite you to try your hand at um, a little bit of active learning and have you um, do take a uh, like um, and have you take a turn at sorting um, a small set of photos applying the categories that we are that we've been using. So I just put in the chat right now a link to a Google form that has in it um, embedded pictures and then asks a series of questions about those pictures and I'm adding also now a link to um, if you are curious if you want to um, sort of use the officially sanctioned definitions that our team has been developing for what constitutes group work, what constitutes discussion, et cetera. You can refer to that second link that I dropped that is category definitions. And so we'll take about five minutes, which would put us at 1.23 Pacific time. I'm not sure where y'all are, but 23 after um, that to check back in and see where we're all at. We'll have a chance to do what we do in our weekly meetings, which is to compare our answers and see uh, where definition, where differences lie. So. Uh, feel free to follow that link and I'll check, I'll call y'all back to order in um, at 23 or 24 after. Okay, so Naveed has handed over to me uh, um, the screen controls. So I will, um, so I mentioned that what we do when we meet as a, the human coding team with the me and the R and, and the RAs working on this project is to um, we look at the photos that were ambiguous that people coded differently during the um, the interval between weekly meetings and we do a lot of this and so just as a quick sort of example of that so for the folks who have responded um, on the first picture which I should be able to pull up what those pictures look like um, most people agreed that it was a facing forward configuration, but not everyone. Did I just, are we, are we still watching the, the, looking at the results? Are we on a different screen now? I just realized I changed the, um, there we go. There we go. Okay. So most people agreed that the classroom layout was, um, was facing forward, but not everybody. There was some ambiguity there. Some people thought it was round, others said they couldn't categorize it. Where we tend to get more disagreement is here. So most people thought that the activity was solo writing. And if you think back to that first picture, which was a professor standing with his back to the camera and then most students bent over their desks, most people thought that that was solo writing, but some people were like, well, what if it's lecture and they're all taking notes about what he was saying? Or um, one person looks like marked as solo reading. Like, how do we know that they're writing not reading like what indicators do we look for there um, and then the and then this is true of the students when we work together too of the RAs when we're working together is that there tends to be a lot of disagreement about whether or not the picture is ambiguous so um, most people a slight majority said that it wasn't but a pretty hefty set of people said that it was ambiguous so um, for those of you who selected that the activity was lecture, there's a follow-up question, are the students writing or taking notes during the lecture? So people who thought it was a lecture were like, yes, so everybody's taking notes dutifully, this is a lecture picture. But other people interpreted that same one as a writing activity where the students might have been asked to answer a question or jot down a paragraph or something like that. Um, so for the second photograph, just and we won't go through all of these, but the second photograph, people were a lot less um, ambivalent of what, what was in it. So that was where their desks were in a big, a big round. So we, so most people, everybody selected round. Most people thought that that indicated that it was a large group discussion, but other people were like, well, just because the tables are in a round configuration, does that mean it's actually a discussion or are, are the tables just set that way? How do you tell? And this is something we talk about, like, does the fact that it's in a circle configuration mean that it's a change the dynamic from lecture, even if, for example, you can see the speaker who's talking and the speaker clearly seems to be the instructor. What does that mean? And again, we see like um, here, most people didn't think it was ambiguous, but a handful did. And what we're seeing here too, is that there's a lot more consistency in the, um, oh, and then are people taking notes? If you've selected lecture, no, they're not. Um, for, so here, this one for classroom layout, there was, this was much more ambiguous. This was the photo I think where, um, this, was, this was picture number three. Um, so I'm trying to open it, in. I'm trying to open it in another window so that we can look at it at the same time. But um, here there was a lot more ambiguity about even what the layout of the classroom was, let alone what activity was going on in it. Uh, okay, 
So just for a quick, because this one seems to be a lot of ambiguity about, so there's a pretty big split between facing forward, cannot categorize, and uh, round or circle configuration for the layout. And then for the activity, there's a lot of difference of opinion too. So a lot of, the majority of people said lecture, but a couple of people said solo writing, others said um, a solo reading activity, or some said head turn. So if I change screens real quickly, um, if like, for those of you who looked at this photo, to invite you to tag in really quickly and say, um, what did you think was going on here and what criteria or characteristics in the photo did you notice that made you assign those labels to it? And you're welcome to respond here either by like turning off your, um, turning your mic on and, and just like shout and just like tossing your answer in, or you can um, use the, the chat box to um, type in what characteristics you paid attention to here that helps you figure out what label to, to apply. Yeah. I, I felt, this is Jenny speaking. I felt that while the professor was off away from the chairs and the chairs were set in a somewhat C-shaped configuration, that they were all looking towards the screen. Uh, and one student in particular, the gentleman on the far right with his legs crossed, he, unlike the majority of the students, was actually looking at the screen and not at their their books, whereas the, the man in the foreground, uh, you know, his white t-shirt was actually writing notes. So to me, it felt more of a forward facing configuration or purpose of the room. Yeah, I'm looking at if, if, any, if there's another person who wants to like talk during the session, I'm looking quickly at some of the comments in the chat box here. Um, so uh, people noted, so uh, like one of the things you look at, whether the heads are up or heads are down, so looking forward or looking down to their desks, whether or not they have a pencil, writing implement in the hand. Somebody mentioned this was really hard. Some are looking at the screen, some of them are looking down. Um, the location of the professor standing in the back, but not in front of the students behind them is also interesting. Noticing the projections on the wall, so they seem to be facing the side of the room, not the front, but what they're doing is like the kind of thing you do if you were facing forward. Um, um, and the person, even the person behind, yeah, like this person standing behind. And so the, the factors that, that people are pointing to in this um, like sort of quick and dirty analysis of this photo are exactly the same things that we have ended up talking about in the, um, in when we meet is like, these are the small details. So like, what is, how do we, how do we recognize writing when we see it? What counts as discussion? Um, does this count as round if they're kind of in an arc, but like most, some of the students are in front or behind each other? There are a lot of um, a lot of different things going on here, and it's, it it shows, I think, um, among other things, how ambiguous what happens in the classroom is oftentimes, which leads to a lot of the kinds of questions that Naveed was was raising at the beginning of our session about how to interpret the research that we many of us have known and read that talks about the benefits of active learning pedagogies. Like, what do they really look like in practice, as well as to what extent, how frequently are they used? Um, so rather than go through that, uh, like do as I uh, sort of do in our weekly meetings with the RAs to march through all our pictures and talk about all these small criteria to get, let us get onto the rest of the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and let Naveed take back the slideshow um, so that we can, I can say a few remarks and then I'll hand things over to Andres who will talk about our neural network that we're using, that we are, will be using to, with the photos that have been labeled as well as our unlabeled archive of the whole set of photos. So some of the challenges you all had a chance to experience um, with this test activity, what are we looking for? So particularly sort of distinguishing between passive or banking um, banking-based learning activities like lecture um, and interactive learning activities, larger small group discussions, the presence of writing or reading, um, and especially how in, once we, especially for those different interactive activities, how difficult it can be to distinguish between them, especially given that from the research we have different expectations or we know different things about the impact of, in, in, of injecting writing as a high impact practice in the classroom, the injection of, of extensive group work or certain ways of structuring group work or the Socratic method or a large circle discussion format. So those are our descriptive challenges. What do we see? And then our interpretive, cha our interpretive challenges, how, what does what we're seeing mean? How do we translate that into some of the um, standard pedagogies that we know about from the research? And then we have some procedural challenges too, which is coordinating the labor of a lot of people who are, especially right now during our pandemic, spread all the way from the East Coast of the United States to Asia. So just coordinating that labor is, um, has was like a, a, a challenge to figure out how to do it. 
Um, we used, like you said, so the students actually used the, a Google form similar to the one that you used um, rather than um, a qualitative data analysis program like MaxQDA or uh, deduce or something like that, right, re largely for cost reasons. And then um, we use a homemade DART program to convert the Google responses into a big matrix that um, that puts in parallel all the responses for a particular piece of data, a particular photograph. And then we use, in SPSS, we um, can we compare inter-rater reliability using FLICE multi-rater kappa statistic in order to get to that, in order to, to see where we're at in terms of agreement between people with the hopes of turning over a very high, consistently labeled set of uh, photographs over to the neural network team for the kind of work that Andres is going to talk about passing things off to him. Oh, 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 there we go. That's the meet button. All right. Well, my name is Andres Mauricio Caccia, and I will be explaining to you the Classroom Configuration Identifier, or CCID, which is the neural network we built in order to assist Julia in classifying the various thousands of pictures that we were gathering from each uh, uh, separate uh, classroom site. So CCID um, is a convolutional neural network that we have retrained in MATLAB in order to um, properly classify the various images that um, we have received. Now, this was, this was originally done a few years ago back when we were still doing the prototyping stage. As a result, the categorizations that we have uh, trained the CCID on and the categorizations that Julia and her students are now attempting to um, use are different. Originally, we were only focusing on forward-facing lectures, circular or the round, um, what we call the round category, which is that circular shape small group discussions, and empty classrooms. We did this uh, using a convol oh, could you go back a bit? We did this using a convolutional neural network called AlexNet, which we, um, it, it's a older and re um, retrained uh, ver uh, convolutional neural network that is often used uh, for this transfer learning. So now we can move on to the next one. The neural network, since managing one is not intuitive to the layperson, um, we packaged it within an executable file that can be easily run in a command line. And all it needs is a location of the um, folder where you have a bunch of unsorted images, and it will output um, those the uh, classification for those images how many are in each one, and what frequency percentage they are in. This makes it exceedingly useful for, uh, example, taking one entire class and all of the pictures taken in that class, putting it, all of those uh, pictures in one folder, and then running uh, the executable, which will instantly give you a breakdown of how that class was divided. And then you can also further go and um, take looks at, uh, for example, time period divisions. Uh, next. Right, so the full results that we managed to achieve with CCID is we managed to achieve an accuracy of 97%. This is exactly what we were looking for because one of the benefits of computer vision um, artificial intelligence is that they can get a higher level of accuracy than even humans can. We had to gather, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a, a, quite a bit of a noise in the background. But um, we had to gather um, over a thousand images, of which we use 90, uh, sorry, 960 for training. Um, that is uh, 240 distinct images from each separate category. And uh, we did this with a group of seven people, and it wound up taking us uh, many weeks to do it. However, we were able to get a high level of agreement, as can be seen by the high level of accuracy that the uh, model was uh, finally able to achieve. And you can see here the results. The highest level of confusion that the model ran into would be in the case of um, seeing a lecture class and assuming that it was a group selection. There were 13 uh, errors in that case. But as you can see, compared to the uh, total breakdown of um, other uh, sections, that is far less than uh, any other um, 
than any of the correct choices. So that's how we were going able to get that high level of accuracy. And now I will provide a practical demonstration of uh, the model work. So allow me to share my screen. Wonderful. So here's MATLAB and I have already uh, downloaded all of the images onto my computer. So I will be able to simply run it and show you how the model trains. Now it should be noted that we are training this on a much smaller percentage of um, uh, images. Normally it would take um, close to uh, half an hour in order to train on 200 images, for example. But um, since we were working with a smaller one here, we are able to achieve a high level of accuracy quickly. So after training the image, we then proceed to classify all of the uh, data, and then we um, evaluate our error. In this case, we managed to get 100% level of accuracy, which of course is not something you're going to run into, but it's only um, 300%, uh, so 300%, 3% off of our uh, uh, real life um, uh, case, which was 97%. And so now I will also provide you a example of the model training an image. Come on, run, if you would please. And of course it decides to not, oh wait, no, here it is. Uh, can you see this? Okay, wonderful. Um, so here, for example, you can see um, a image of um, students uh, looking towards one side, which was labeled as lecture. Now, one of the things that you will be able to note about uh, these pictures is that we are being forced to deal with images that are entirely unstandardized. There is no standardized classroom setup. There is no standardized camera position within the classroom setup. and there are several amount of uh, difficulties that we run into when achieving a high level of accuracy. We're able to do that, however, because we use a convolutional neural network, which allows the computer to go in and select the most identifiable features um, between different categories in order to get a high level of categorization, even though there isn't a human brain behind it. And um, you can also see that there is uh, some level of uh, image processing done on uh, the images in order to remove uh, you know, fisheye effects and uh, standardize it uh, for input to a computer. And that wraps up the CCID section. Um, so hi, hi, I'm Mika and I and Ma Max and I will present the data science, the stuff that we have so far and kind of we'll also talk about what we hope to do in the future as well. So a little bit of overview of what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about the, actually Naveed, could you refresh the slide for a second? So we'll be talking about kind of the data pipeline and um, like, you know, also like about the data itself. Next, we'll talk about the, give me a second, we'll talk about the work that we've done so far in regards to the basic graphs and like the demographic, in terms of the demographic counts and GPA. And we'll also talk about the logistic model, which is kind of the data science part of it. And then finally, we'll give kind of like a demo of the model that we have so far. Um, I can just present it. So let me see if I can share my slide. Share screen. Oh, no, perfect. Thank you, Naveed. Um, so first I'll um, kick it off to Max to talk about kind of what we hope to do with the data pipeline. So Max. Awesome. So the data we received from the school was in the form of CSVs. Um, and though that's nice for small projects to looking at data. Uh, we want something to be scalable. We want something to be easily accessible. So what we'll be working on, and we have been implementing into our project is taking all the data we're given and then converting it onto an accessible platform and then allowing for all of our queries to pass to that platform. So what I'm still working on right now, and we're still implementing, um, but it is working in terms of tests, is taking the CSV files we received from the school uh, using Python to interpret that and parse it, and then put it on an accessible uh, MySQL server on Google Cloud. 
So what we have so far and what we're using, as uh, Max mentioned, is that we're getting data from the registrar, but we're also getting data from uh, the Dr. Voss's and Andreas's side, the neural network side of the classroom layout. So right now, even though um, Julia did talk about having more than like four categories, the data we have so far is empty, groups, lecture, and roundtable. Uh, the registrar data we have in terms of grades, course information like the subject itself, course title, whatnot. Um, we also have the major, the students, their ethnicity, their sex, and their first gen. As mentioned the, earlier, it's also all anonymized, so we don't know specifically who the students are. Uh, in addition, we originally re received around 1,200 data points. It kind of had to be filtered into 1,100, and I'll talk about why in a second. Um, so the way it so we kind of pre-processed the data and the reason why it kind of reduced is because some of the grades were not the typical letter A to F grades. Some of them were like, for example, withdraw, incomplete, pass, no pass. And so while those are significant data points, with the model, it kind of gets a little wonky and I'll talk about that when we talk about the logistic model. So next slide. So kind of the categories, even though there's so many, like the registrar gave us a lot of categories, we, for this time being, which will expand on hopefully in the future, right now we looked at sex, ethnicity, if the student was first generation or not. We also looked at the grade they received and the numerical equivalent, so 0 to 4.0 GPA scale. And we also looked at the classroom layout, so the neural network side, like what kind of like the class they were taking, what was kind of the breakdown of the pedagogical, like, you know, the pedagogical breakdown and also the course info. So like what, like if they're in a civil engineering class or if they're taking like Spanish two or something, so stuff like that. So for this, for we will illustrate kind of what we've done through two examples. So the first we'll talk about the CTW. So CTW in our school is kind of a core requirement. It's like a English critical thinking and writing and students are required to take it. Um, there's two levels, one and two, but if you're an honor student, you take the honors version. And so we chose that one because it had the highest amount of data points, 347. And it was a good split between men and women. Uh, and also there are 20 different class sessions. So that means 20 different classroom layouts. So hopefully that means there'll be a lot of, um, uh, there'll be a lot of like, you know, variety. Next slide. Uh, and so this is also, so the registrar data, it kind of talks of, it shows like the students in the class, but that's not the whole picture. We kind of want to see, you know, the grades they earned. We also want to see kind of like the classroom layout. So this is kind of the first, like, you know, step of the visualization. Uh, next slide. And we also looked at civil engineering, which is the second highest data point count. We had 191 data points. Unfortunately, as known in the engineering world, there's much more men. It's a much more men in it than women. Uh, and also there were only seven total sessions. Um, but a uh, unique thing is that there was a lot more um, grades that were below B minus. So that means we'll may have more um, data variety in GPA and we'll see how that affects the model. Next slide. And here you can see kind of a breakdown. Also not much diversity, but that is what we have with the data. So hopefully in the future, when we collect more data, there'll be more variety. Next slide. So the next, so what we hope to do in the future is kind of have the graph on the web tool kind of show like the breakdown in terms of the classroom layout. But this is the neck, this is the step we have now, which is where we break it down by like, you know, the demographic data. So for in this case, first generation versus non first generation and seeing the grade count that they got. So A to F on uh, next slide, we have it for sex. And we kind of see, as I mentioned before, most of the grades tend to be above B minus, only 10 or so were below the B minus range. Next slide. We also kind of see that break, in, break down in ethnicity, like seeing which like races earn certain amount. Hopefully in the future also with, um, they'll be able to toggle and not see all of them and see, you know, one at a time if they only want to see Asian or native Hawaiian, they'll see that. So next slide, we did the same thing for civil engineering, so first generation versus not first generation, um, sex, and also here we see like that kind of uniform, like, you know, in terms of the grade, it's pretty, unlike, you know, like a downward curve, this one seems to be a little bit more uniform. All right, next slide. So we hope to, 
so this is the first step in terms of the data modeling, but we also want to like see, well, the neck, the bigger picture of how does all of those categories plus the classroom breakdown, how does that affect learning outcomes and does it affect learning outcomes. So for this project, I used a logistic regression and in the interest of time, I'll touch on the really important parts. Uh, basically, reason why we use logistic over things like numerical analysis, analysis or neural network is there's a lot of categorical data. For example, you cannot, it's not continue, well, you can't say, you can't put a number on what ethnicity a person is like. It's not like, oh, he, it's not a continuous like value between one and 10. It's base, it's a, it's a category. And so it kind of, it's not, it's not right. It's not the right model to do linear regression. In addition, we could have used a neural network, but the thing is that we would risk overfitting because it's very powerful tool. And so logistic regression like kind of prevents that overfitting and it is perfect for categorical and like a mix of categorical and numerical data. So, and also I wanted to make a brief thank you to Jason Brownlee. I checked his website and he had a great, like he, like it had a great way to show how to like deal with that kind of mix of data. Um, next slide. So I will briefly say the steps. Basically summarizing it is you edit the data to fit the model because in its raw state, the mo the model's not going to know how to handle it. You train 80, per you split the data, you train 80% of it and then test 20, trust it on the other 20% to see how accurate it is. So you know how much should you trust the model or not. And then you predict it on whatever input you want to do, whether you want to do one student, 10 students, 100 students, it's all up to you. Next slide. So as a demo, we'll kind of go through an example of what, like, so I came up with four fictitious students. Note, they're not based on anyone. They're just random ones that I came up with my, in my mind, which I thought were diverse. They kind of hit all the three targets. And so we're also gonna see how they perform in two different classroom layouts and see how they do in CTW and computer, I mean, civil engineering. With the CTW, the accuracy was around 36%, but with civil engineering, the accuracy was around 10% and we'll soon see why. So next slide. So with CTW, if the class is at 100% lecture, it seems that everyone does pretty well. They get all A minuses, so that's nice. But if we see in the next slide, if we kind of, you know, have more an all rounded pedagogical learning, like model where we have some group discussion, some roundtable, some of those grades will increase. As you see with student number one and student number three, their grades increase to an A, so that's pretty good. Uh, next slide. However, not all, it, it does not, like that was for CTW, but that doesn't mean it will apply for all subjects. So in this case with civil engineering, there's like, if we have 100% lecture, we have a good mix of A's, B's, but if we apply that same all-rounded model, the grades drop, which is not very good. So it's kind of like not one model fits all. So, I mean, it's nice to see that the model recognizes that, but there are some limitations. Uh, next slide. Um, also, depending on, on what, like the model, like the data you kind of input into the training data, the, the results will vary. And the accuracy, while it's around the same rate, it will vary. So it's just very interesting to think about that. And so next slide. Uh, so we hope in the future to get more variety in data um, in terms as we collect more and more. Uh, it's also interesting to see that even though CTW did not have the same diversity of students, because not the same diverse star, same diversity of grade ranges, like since it was more A's and B's, it had more students and more permutations of race, sex, and first generation or not first generation. And so because of that, it could have made for a higher model, like accuracy, um, which is the shortcoming of the civil engineering, where as there was not as much data variety, but there was so much like different grades that the student could have earned. And so it, that's one thing to keep in mind. 
Uh, also, this model does not look at the instructor. It does not look at the syllabus, like what the work, like the content of the syllabus is. It does not look at personality students, the time of instructions, whatnot. So hopefully in the future, things like the time of the instruction and all we can discuss, like we can add, we can add age, we can add the instructor. So maybe that will be a future step. And yeah, so we will kick it off to Roland to talk about the web tool. Okay, I'll start to share my screen. Um, so this is the web tool that we've been working on recently, um, but please note that this is nowhere near close to done. Uh, we just started working on it. Um, so basically, basically what Mika talked about, um, with all the classroom styles that you guys worked on earlier with the photo sorting, we have lecture, discussion, group work, reading and writing. Um, eventually these sliders will help give you a prediction, um, just like the examples that Mika had shown but we do not have that currently up live on the site yet. So um, for this purpose of the demo, when you use the sliders, make sure that they add up to 100%, um, just so it doesn't run into any errors when you're um, accessing the data. And then similar to the examples that were given earlier as well, we have two classes, one for engineering and the civil engineering department as a whole, but you can also look at specific narrow classes such as English, and then critical thinking and writing will pop up as well. Um, so we have two examples here that you guys can play around with, as well as the student sample. Um, these are the data that we have gotten from the registrar. So we have sex, race, and first generation student. You can select which one you want to be able to see. Um, yeah, and then regardless of whatever you choose for this student sample, you'll be given three graphs, one for each of these demographics. Um, and we'll be able to see that uh, right here, whoops. Uh, yes, yeah. so you'll be able to have the three graphs that you had seen earlier. Um, with the web tool, you'll be able to specify how many, or you can able to zoom in to see how many people or students got the grade in each of these categories. So for sex, um, we have both male and female, but on the right hand side of the screen, you can toggle off and on um, just to like narrow down the focus. Um, so for sex, there's only two categories here, but for race, you have these multiple categories. In case you want to narrow it down, you can click on each of these. Um, just to hide which ones you want to see. And yeah, so this is currently what we have up now. Um, later, we do want to improve this so that um, we'll, be having, we'll be able to access more data and you'll be able to also get the predictions that Mika had been talking about earlier. So yeah. Okay, so... Um even though the team has definitely alluded to all the next steps, I just wanted to bring them together at the end here. Um, we have some developmental next steps. These are dependent on the COVID situation that we're in right now, or I should say heavily dependent. Uh, last quarter, we taught completely online at the university. This summer, we're teaching completely online. And uh, this, this coming fall is going to be just about completely online. So with classes being taught online, there's no new data that we're able to gather. Uh, so that is a problem for our, for our project. Uh, but we also want to move the cameras to new locations in the classrooms. If you notice from the images that you saw, lots of the cameras were placed in uh, you know, suboptimal, to put it best, locations. Uh, and that was not um, because someone was negligent. It's because at the time when the project had started and people were installing cameras, they hadn't thought about the fact that these were all going to be uh, uh, categorized using a neural network and so that there would need to be anybody but a human being that can actually uh, look at these things, uh, pay attention to them. And even at the time of the installation, they weren't even thinking that these cameras were going to take so many pictures. They thought, oh, you're going to take a picture once every five minutes or some other uh, small amount that would be very manageable. But since the technology is available, we increase the number of images so we could increase the accuracy and then we needed to use neural networks and we ran into problems like Andres referred to earlier that oh yes there was a fish eye on some of these lenses and so we had to uh, programmatically remove that before we could analyze those images. Uh, so we want to move those cameras so that then we could actually get 
what the instructor is doing in every picture because then for instance we would be able to uh, look at the ambiguity of okay a, a circular shaped uh, classroom or u-shaped classroom might actually not be a group discussion but it might be a lecture given if the, le the lecture is at the board writing and everybody is taking notes of that rather than discussing so we'd be able to actually answer questions a lot better that way uh, also we want to add uh, cameras to lots of uh, uh, classrooms that are currently actually under construction and classrooms that already exist because then this way we would be able to get a lot more data and also with the under construction classrooms we're going to be able to focus on getting the entirety of data of a certain subcategory which would be uh, a lot of data that we could actually analyze a lot easier. Uh, then of course given more data we, we will enhance the uh, CCID tool so we can identify a lot more things like for instance other pedagogical practices that weren't seen at the time. Um, then on the, the data uh, gathering side of this well you know we're going to have to uh, uh, come up with essentially mapping the things that Julia talked about all those different categories and how the neural network is actually going to identify those. Uh, then we're going to on the data, data science aspect get, figure out how to incorporate more categories other than just the sex, uh, the first generation, and the uh, race data that we had right now. So for instance, we'd look at uh, if English is a second language or other uh, important categories. Uh, and then we would look at external variables. This would be the actual technology in the classroom, for instance, did people use that technology? Or what about the fact that this class is being taught in the evenings does that have an effect on this like can we see more people kind of drew you know falling asleep in the in the class if it's early in the morning or, or late at night um, so there's those kind of things that can actually be in, uh, taken into account to enhance the data uh, and then lastly of course we still have to do the assessment that the institutional research has asked from us but that's something that we're pushing far out as as much as possible we will get to that when we we can actually give real uh, good results for that Okay, so just to conclude, this is basically the, the workflow that we've gone through. We have a bunch of images. Those images were fed to a neural network. We got a confusion matrix for that. We got registrar information in, in CSV format. We parsed them, did some work with them, fed both of these to our system and got a, uh, a graph that basically is going to show uh, how those demographics are performing based on the breakdown of the pedagogical practices. And, and this graph basically uh, would be something that can change based on the smallest changes that happen in the pedagogical practice. If for instance, we have that kind of data already specifically, or inferring that based on the work that Mika showed you, if we don't necessarily have the exact breakdown of 30% lecture, 20% discussion, 50% group work, but we have similar classes, we would be able to still make that inference and be able to give um, reasonable information. Um, so then uh, to, to finish this off, I wanted to give a shout out to um, all the different organizations that have been involved in this with for us. Uh, we're the Epic Lab, so that's, that's our, our laboratory that uh, where we're doing our, our work, even though everything is remote now. Uh, Santa Clara University obviously has been a big supporter of this, the Frugal Innovation Hub, which supports us uh, both in terms of staffing and, and finding uh, students that have been interested on, on working on stuff in the past, uh, to uh, other support, um, the two departments that have been supporting us continuously, the mathematics and computer science and computer science and engineering. They provided funding, for instance, one summer for student employees. Um, uh, we basically, oh yes, uh, we have, uh, we've been using math, uh, MathWorks' MATLAB software in order to do lots of the work and their engineers have been very uh, open and very uh, willing to help us out. Uh, Andres has emailed them in the middle of the night and they've gotten back to him in the morning, you know, uh, so, so they've been very helpful. Uh, IEEE obviously has been very crucial for us because we were able to write a paper that was peer reviewed and published. Uh, and also we made lots of good connections through them and people gave us ideas, feedback, questions. Uh, the information systems uh, at, the, uh, at the university or IS, which IT and AT are part of, uh, were the people who installed the cameras for us and maintained the networks so we could collect the information. Uh, and then of course, most importantly, we have the 
um, uh, the uh, technical in, uh, learning um, group on campus, which basically gave the initial funding for us to be able to uh, start the project, to get cameras, to do all the, the work that uh, has been done. Um, with that, I would like to open it up to questions and answers. And I think we have a good 15 minutes to, uh, to address those questions. I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Emily, who's going to help facilitate that Q&A. But I encourage you, we do have two questions from earlier that we definitely want to get to. Uh, but for anyone else that's out there, I encourage you to put some answer or some questions in the chat and Emily will share them with the panel or the presenters. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. So we have two questions. The first question was from Cherry Carter at the beginning. Um, why not talk, and she was uh, chatting back and forth with Julia. Why not talk about androgyny as intertwined with pedagogy? Are there any studies on both teaching methods to collect big data? And I'll just paste that again in the chat <laughs> so that you can. Yeah, you're muted, yeah. Um, so I, I'm guessing, so you're talking about the teaching children versus teaching adults, that like kind of distinction in like what type of learners are we talking about? A lot of the, so the, the research that we're building off of and trying to situate ourselves in is kind of like trying to strike a middle position. It's almost all of it specifically comes from research on college students. And because of the extent to which most pedagogical research for, um, on college students comes from R1 type institutions, those are overwhelmingly um, traditionally aged students. And so it's like, we're talking about the 18 to 25 year old population. And so um, one that's, which is exactly the same population that we're working on, we're, we're working with at Santa Clara, we have an overwhelming majority of uh, traditionally aged college students. We have very few adult students. Um, but that it kind of strikes, it's a, it's a little bit of a balance of both, right? And that it's, um, that like students are assumed to have more autonomy and more responsibility for guiding their own learning than say primary school age kids. But not as much as, for example, um, like returning, like returning after after being in the workforce, adult learners who typically have like very concrete and specific goals that guide their own learning, and part of that is pointed to in the classes that Mika and Max hold as their example classes, the CTW that is first year writing classes and engineering classes. That's a, like your question makes me wonder how stuff like that is in play there. So for civil engineering classes, those are all classes that are major specific. People are majoring in civil engineering. They take all these civil engineering classes. There's a cohort of students that all know each other from the civil engineering program. And these classes all like, you know, tick toward their degree requirements as well as toward things they see as like being incredibly useful for their professions. If you contrast that with first year writing classes, which are a required general education class, most students would not choose to take them if they were not required is a good example of a case where motivation and that's and, and, so, and a lot of the factors that distinguish andragogy and pedagogy come up um, and a lot of the factors that distinguish those two different um, sort of like populations for education and it would come up. So this is making me think that Roland was talking about the um, when we are and in, in further iterations of this project we're going to have more sliders and more categories that'll be possible for um, classifying classes or like or, or zeroing in on what type of class you're talking about. A really useful one this conversation is illustrating would be um, elective or major specific versus general education classes. Um, which as for those of us in this, like in this, at this panel who are teachers can have a lot to say about the difference in ways in which students engage, regardless of the sort of nature of like the demographics of the student population, age, first gen status, whatever, um, in classes that are major electives versus classes that are um, mandatory gen ed classes. But it's a really good question. And in some ways our population strikes a balance between those things, but in other ways it might be very different for different courses. Awesome. Chair, did you have a, any follow-up questions? Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to. All right, maybe not. So um, while, Cherry, if you would like to respond in the chat, feel free to do that as well. You can just pop up a mute. Um, cool. We, we have a response from Connie here in the chat. I would like to ask about how well the faculty accept taking part in this type of research. Do they accept the feedback and accept modifying the pedagogical practices to support their students' learning? <laughs> Take it away. I say, Navi, do you want to? Sure. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, 
So as far as the participation of the faculty, we basically started with that IRB in the sense that it was an opt-in and all of the faculty had to uh, agree. And then also all the students in the class had to agree to have their photo taken. Um, and if even one student said no, that class was excluded. So that was actually very problematic for uh, data gathering at the, at the beginning. Um, uh, now we, we, with our renewed IRB, we have been able to make it a little bit easier to where we can allow them to opt out um, in, a, in an easier way than the way where we had to exclusively go and get an opt in from each one. They can still opt out. Um, uh, so that's going to help us a lot with the data gathering, but we haven't been able to test that because COVID hit right when we got that IRB approval. So we had no new data to report on that. Um, but on the faculty and, and their uh, willingness, they all have seen a value to this. Uh, but again, as we still haven't gotten to the point where we can really give them the, the lever tool, uh, we don't have much feedback to give you yet on, on whether it has been useful for the faculty in, in developing their curriculum. Uh, so hopefully next year when you come back, we'll have the results for you. Awesome. We have some more questions coming up in the chat here. I want to make sure we get to a question yes. that was asked earlier as well. I, I, can I answer one? Uh, Connie had a, uh, a follow-up, yeah, which I think would apply to everybody. Yes, absolutely. We are looking for people who would want to collaborate on this project in any institution. Um, so absolutely. That's a yes for everybody on this call or if there's other researchers at your institutions that want to work on this, uh, we are op completely open to collaboration. So please pass on the word. Back to you, Emily. <laughs> awesome. I love that. So everybody's going to be reaching out to you, Naveen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So we had a question earlier. Uh, was the model, this was um, earlier in your presentation when you're showing the actual model, was that able to differentiate between small and large groups? Right, I'll tackle that question then. So the model that we originally showed categorized um, classroom formats into four major categories. Empty classrooms where no one was present at all. Like uh, forward-facing classrooms, which we call lecture uh, classrooms where people were simply just looking forward um, to a speaker or a screen. Small group discussions, which is when students were divided up into groups greater than one. And round uh, table discussions where students were just all in one giant uh, group discussion sort of thing where you know the seats were all arranged to everyone face each other in a round table format. So technically, yes is uh, the answer, though I'm not entirely sure if it's to the level that uh, you were just you were thinking. But yes, we. The thing is that is that um, when it comes to machine learning, so long as we provide the convolutional neural network with the data of smaller groups versus larger groups, for uh, um, to allow it to differentiate between the two, then we will be able to differentiate between the two with a high level of accuracy. Awesome. If there are any uh, follow-up questions related to that, feel free to pop those in the chat. And I also see Cherry unfortunately missed the answer to her question. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> maybe Julia, if you'd be so kind to just briefly follow up. You're on mute. <laughs> you mean now. Um, just really quickly is to say that uh, one, because we're teaching a population of traditionally aged college students, we have students who are kind of in the middle between children and adults, mm -hmm. um, which is true of most of the research that we're building off of and speaking back to. Um, it's also true that your question raises an interesting point about whether it'd be useful to separate general education classes that students tend to take because they have to and are much more likely to ma manifest more of the like pedagogy, like child education stuff of, about like the teacher really being responsible for a lot of learning versus the andragogy perspective that puts a lot more of the onus on the adult and thinks a lot more about the motivations of the learner, which are where you would, we would expect to see more of, and this would be something to test in major specific classes that students have opted into based on their professional goals. So it's a really good question and something that um, would be awesome for Roland to add to our web interface tool for faculty to use when thinking about their classes. Thank you. And I invite you to follow up with us um, after the session if you want to talk more about this because it's an angle we hadn't really considered. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Voss. My concern with the andragogy versus pedagogy and, and our demographics where I am, it's 95% people of color. So we have people having to retrain, which are adult, adults and uh, andragogy would require me to base my teaching on their experience. So my question is, is an intertwinement because it's hard for me to scale it sometimes. And, and thank you. So this is, and so the question you're asking about scaling is always a big, it's, it's always a problem or always an issue and especially complicated by the situation you're talking about where you have a lot of people who are returning from time in the workforce, like they're all return, they're all adult returning students, but what they're returning from is all over the map. And so requires a lot of specific differentiation, which is where, and this is the part that we're getting to that we haven't, because we're still in the building project process here, is working with faculty or with faculty development offices to put together the demographic information teachers have about their students with some of this data-driven um, information about what the learning outcomes are based on different pedagogies to offer, especially adult students, a little bit more maybe control over what is done in class and a lot of faculty already do things like this like tell me about your experiences in prior classes especially if it's been a while since you were back in the classroom um, and to offer like a, a data-based tool a data-driven tool to put into that process which tends to be very like intuitive and um, anecdotal impressionistic and especially for those of us who are concerned with equity and with how pedagogy might need to respond to students who don't fit into a traditional profile well, like you're talking about because of their age because of their their work background experience because of their race because as mika was highlighting it at santa clara as that as is true of many of the students in the schools where a lot of this research has been done the student population is overwhelmingly white and we would expect that at like a lot of things relating to education this would be really different if we had um, an hsi institution or an hbcu institution so that is to say, all of the things that you're bringing up are really, really good questions for our study and they bring up the limitation of being so focused on a single institution. There was a question that somebody else asked a few minutes ago about like, would love to get to partner with this, could we like to expand to other institutions and we would really, really like that too, which is part of the reason to present here to try and reach out to folks during this building phase of the project who are at other institution types. So immediate utility for your question, I don't know that we have much to offer you right this minute, but we would love to talk to you further about it. Especially your demographic that you're describing is going to be very useful for us because our university is actually very predominantly white for undergraduate and when it comes to graduate very predominantly Indian and uh, I guess now Asian students. Um, so, so the African American is very underrepresented at our university. So that would be that would help to study immensely. Um. I couldn't help but notice that Ms. Boss uh, mentioned that since we're teaching college students, let's say, that we're kind of like in between a pedagogy and andragogy. And uh, my question is, or I'm just wondering, what aspects of these college students would you make you think of pedagogical methods? You know, what aspects especially you tend you uh, uh, ask you to think of those methods? So I think the 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 most traditional format for college education is one I think that's designed with an adult learner in mind. That is, teacher lectures, students listen. If they have a question, it's on them to ask it. Um, there are you know there's an exam at the end of the term, and that's the basis of your grade. That kind of setup and a lot of active learning. Um, techniques are predicated on the idea that that doesn't really work all that well for for many people and especially anyone who falls outside of the sort of classic college student from back in history that is an affluent white man um, and so active learning techniques build in things like um, the scaffolding of a big project so you turn in like a one deliverable every two weeks to build up to a final you have a weekly quiz builds in things like um, everybody talk about this problem then we'll compare our answers and talk through everybody's solutions and try and figure out why it's like how people how some people where some people went wrong that kind of stuff um, and so uh, the and I think I might, I may mis mischaracterizing this a little bit in terms of what is expect, like what kind of responsibilities students themselves are expected to take on for their own learning versus what, how much responsibility faculty are expected to take on to create conditions conducive to learning. Um, and um, the points that, that Cherry Carter brought up about um, uh, like 
not appealing to, but like designing pedagogies that resonate with people who have work experience where they're like, would might be resistant to a teacher who's like micromanaging them or telling them what to do or who is um, failing to acknowledge the valuable experience they bring from 20 years of working in X or Y industry into the classroom um, are things that would shift maybe the balance between different ones of these activities that we're identifying in the analysis of the pictures, as well as um, tailoring exactly how those are delivered. Like how often do we meet? How much interaction is there between teachers and students? Those kinds of things. And I see this as, as we're talking about this now, especially I see this as a really useful, our tool is a really useful addition to a lot of the collection of student information and feedback that faculty do at the beginning of the term, sometimes at the end, of, at the middle of the term, oftentimes at the end of the term to intersect that with um, um, data from collected from like real kind of on the ground classrooms. I want to tie in really quickly to a question that somebody asked a while ago in the chat about why not why use pictures for this? Why not use surveys? Um, and one of the things that's valuable about using photographs and then cross referencing that with student um, learning data, like grade data, is that it lets us see what everyone in the class is, what's happening with everyone in the class. Whereas one of the problems with surveys, and this can be a problem with the, when you ask students for feedback, is that you tend to get a lot of feedback from some people and not a lot of feedback or none from others. And one of the useful things about using official um, educational records and photographs is that you're capturing what is happening with everyone even though it introduces a lot of sort of confounding variables in how we make sense of that data once we've got it. Okay. So I feared a little bit off. Yeah, and, and Joaquin, I think another thing that might help with, uh, with that answer for you is that, well, uh, Santa Clara University is a university that um, was a regional university up until last year, and we just got elevated into being a, a national university, and uh, we basically were very highly ranked actually when we entered the game here. We're now 52nd or 4th or something like that uh, in the national universities in the US before we were the number one regional university in the region west of the US. So our demographics is also undergoing a, a shift. Um, I know from, for instance, the admissions people, they said that after that shift, the amount of international students that are applying now for undergraduate degrees has dramatically increased, for example. Um, so, so that's also another reason why our, our campus culture is more, um, more, I don't wanna say the word conservative, but it's more sort of traditional, right? Uh, compared to maybe some, some of the universities like Stanford or UC Berkeley, which have been in that space of having ma major amount of out of state and out of country students. Uh, so, so that is also a bit of a sh cultural shift that's going to affect both the research, but also what exactly happens with the pedagogy in, on campus wide. Not to mention just adding to more complexity to the data science portions because a um, you know, Latino student who is uh, not from the United States of America and a uh, Latino Chicano student who is uh, from the United States of America are going to have, you know, different backgrounds, different upbringings and cannot be combined into the same uh, category. Thank you. Well, I hate to bring this amazing discussion to an end, but we are six minutes over. So please connect with each other. We have some exciting uh, events coming up later today as well as tomorrow. Some other really great talks. Uh, just want to take a moment and really thank our entire panel for a fantastic and thought provoking presentation and also a really fun uh, piece of interactivity there to try out the model. So thank you for that. Absolutely, you're very welcome. Yes, and right. please, uh, people reach out to us. We are more than happy to to answer any questions or or talk to you further in, um, in, in, on any direction, really. So, yeah. especially what Naveed mentioned earlier about the possibility of institutional collaboration. Since every institution has particular characteristics, and for the project, obviously, it's very valuable to have a varied set of data and student body and stuff like that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Even more sessions. Bye. Bye. -bye.